Good morning, good morning, good morning, my dear Galilee family. How are you this fine September, fall, cool morning? God bless you to everyone. And I come this morning in the name of Jesus. And then we have our Sunday school lesson today, and, and uh, we're going to get into it and, and uh, uh, make a few points, and then we'll, we'll make way for our message this morning. Uh, welcome uh, to our Galilee family and to those out in radio land and FaceTime land that uh, uh, we thank you for allowing us to come in this morning to say a few words and, and uh, hope uplift someone as we go through this lesson uh, for this week. Our fall quarter lesson for this week, our unit one, God calls Abraham's family. And the children's unit, unit one, God chooses Abraham's family. Uh, here on this Sunday morning, uh, the scepter is given to Judah, uh, is our lesson title. And before uh, I uh, get going here, we are located here, 2624 East 25th Street, where the Honorable Pastor Fitz Lee Lines Jr. is our pastor. And... Uh, <clears throat> Our doors are open, and if you don't have a church home, feel free. Uh, our services start here this morning around 1115, and uh, we will be, uh, we know that uh, when our pastor comes, we will have a word <clears throat> from on high. But before again, as I, as I continue on, let us say a, a short prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this another day. We just love and appreciate and, and, and need you, Father. We just thank you, Father, for last night's lying down and this morning's rise. We just thank you, Father, for just being you and being you all by yourself. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who hung, bled, and died that we could have this right to this tree of life. We just thank you, Father. We love, we need, we can't do without you. Now, Father, as we go through this day, we ask for your wisdom, we ask for your knowledge, we ask for your understanding as we go through this lesson. We hope we say a word or two that will help someone. Father, we ask we continue to bless our leaders, bless our church, bless our pastor in a special way as he is away uh, with an illness. We just thank you, Father, for touching his body and, and helping to uh, bring him back. We just thank you, Father, for those uh, that are under the sound of my voice. We just thank you, Father, for just being you. Father, we ask you to just bless the sick, bless the shut-in, bless the bereaved families. Father, touch them in a special manner. We just thank you, Father. We love, we need, we can't do without you. If we had a thousand tons, Father, we cannot say it enough. We just thank you, Father, for being you. Continue to lead, guide, and bless our church. Bless our pastor once again and his family. Father, uh, may you continue to make him the leader that you have made him. And we be the followers that, that you have given him the word to do. We just thank you, Father. We just thank you, Father. We just thank you, Father. We just thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, when we've done all that we can do, and we can no longer be on this side, Father, we ask you just to usher us in to your place, Father, where you say there are many, many mansions, Father. Just give us one. Usher us in to your kingdom where we can praise your name forevermore. And these blessings and others we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Once again, good morning. Good morning. We have a great lesson. The scepter is given to Judah. Our adult and uh, youth uh, topic is dynamics of family leadership. Our youth topic is dynamics of family leadership. Our children's general lesson title is the scepter is given to Judah. And then our children's topic is choosing a family leader. Our devotional reading for this lesson, numbers 24, 2 through 9. 15 through 17. Our adult and youth background scripture, Genesis 35, 22b through 26, uh, chapter 38, 12 through 19, 24 through 26, and then chapter 49, 8 through 12. Our print passage for adult and youth are Genesis 35, 22b through 26, 38, 24 through 36, 49, 10, through 12 and our key verse 
And I'll read that on the international side, uh, in an international version. Our key verse, Genesis 49 and 10. Uh, our children's background scriptures are about the same. Genesis 35, 22b through 26, 38, 12 through 19, 24 through 26, 49, 8 through 12. And then the print patches for pass passage for our children's Genesis 35, 22b through 26, 49, 8 through 12. And then our key verse again is the same, uh, Genesis 49 and 10. And I will read that uh, <clears throat> from the New International Version. It reads as follows. The scripture will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his and we'll go through that we know who that is uh, when it says the obedience of the nations shall be his and we'll get to that here shortly uh, our unifying lesson principle for our lessons today people often link the family challenges they face in the present to the challenges faced in previous generations how do we overcome the problems we inherited from our families of origin? God called Jacob's fourth son, Judah, to lead a dysfunctional family from whose family would emerge the nation of Israel and one day God's chosen Messiah. Dysfunctional family, we'll talk a little bit about that. Actually, a lot of it, a lot about that uh, uh, <clears throat> as we get into Jacob's family. And it's a lot about how his family is kind of relates to what a lot of our families are today. OK, when we talk about dysfunction, we'll get in to that. Our lesson objectives today are uh, when we get done with this lesson, we hope to make these three points. Explain Jacob's complicated family dynamics that led to Judah's becoming the leader of his family. Now, Judah was Jacob's fourth son, and we'll see how he became the leader of the family. Uh, since the emotions in the story are those emotions, since the emotions in the story, as those emotions spark their own feelings, okay? There are a lot of emotions, okay? Uh, in this story, all right? And then uh, as we continue in our life and the things that we need uh, to do, uh, to do the things that we're supposed to do, seek wholeness and love amidst challenging family dynamics. Again, we have those challenges with us as our families uh, have, have problems as well. Some of the points that we're gonna try to emphasize as we go through here, God's concern for leadership here involves a submitted and repentant heart of a leader. And those two key words in, in, in this is submitted and repentant, okay? All right, you, you, gotta, you gotta submit and you must repent, okay? Reuben showed no remorse for his sexual misconduct while Judah acknowledged his sin both in his intentional infidelity and in his reluctance to accede to accede to Tamar's legally appropriate demand for a husband. And as we get into that, we'll see uh, the story between Jacob and uh, Tamar, okay? Uh, <clears throat> our historical setting uh, of our lesson uh, today, uh, scholars have not always agreed as to how to calculate the various stages of life of the patriarchs, nor have they been able to establish with absolute certainty, okay, their ages during which certain events took place. That is the case with today's lesson, okay? A lot of things go on in today's lesson. It speaks quite frankly uh, of uh, a dysfunctional family and how they operate, and uh, as we go through the lesson, I, I, I kind of, we were, we were talking the other day in the lesson uh, itself, 
has a couple couple things. It talks about a dysfunctional family. It talks about all kinds of things. And then the, the most part is, listen, God is God. Okay, this is God can do whatever He wants. He can choose whoever He wants to lead. Okay, God can do it because God is God. Okay, this lesson covers an extended period of time that encompasses the middle and later years of Jacob's life. Okay, beginning with his return to Canaan and the subsequent journey into Egypt. Okay. From the, from the biblical text, uh, we learn that Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years, okay? And he was 147 years old when he passed away, okay? Uh, Genesis 35, 20 through 26, uh, 38, 24 through 26, and 40, 19 through 12, which is our lesson text, okay? Provide a panoramic view of the later days of Jacob's life and the saga surrounding his family. We are again introduced to the sons of Jacob, and we are provided the names of their mothers. So we'll go through that lineage here shortly, okay? Uh, the second text takes place late, years later in a point in time that has garnered more debate than answers. The biblical text in the lesson takes place three months after Judah, Jacob's fourth born son, had engaged in illicit sexual relations with his daughter-in-law, who was found to be with child, okay? Dysfunctional family, it, it, it brings it out in this lesson, okay? And then the final part of this lesson uh, covers the period when Jacob blessed his fourth son, Judah, giving to him the position of primacy in the family and there's a reason Judah was chosen okay <clears throat> uh our a little bit about the geographical and cultural settings of this uh, of, of this lesson uh it, it talks about uh the, the the cultural setting when Jacob and Esau we know that story as we've been talking about that in our uh, previous lessons okay uh, where Jacob returned uh, to the land of his birth. Remember, he was sold. Uh, uh, he went out empty, but he came back full. According to Genesis 35, or excuse me, 33, 1 through 15, Jacob and Esau, okay, uh, came face to face near Peniel. Okay, here Jacob declared that when he looked into his brother's face, he saw the face of God. The two estranged brothers, we know they were twins, okay, uh, <clears throat> reconciled and kissed each other, and Jacob gave gifts to his brother. After a while, Jacob and Esau parted ways with Jacob heading west, eventually settling in Sukkot, and Esau returning to Seir in the south. And we know that, that story about how those brothers were uh, born, and then, and then the story of how they were separated in the story of how they they uh, got to uh, to where uh, they were. We are not told how long Jacob remained in Sukkoth, where he built a house and stall for his livestock. Eventually, Jacob made his way across the Jordan River into Canaan and settled in the hill country of Shechem, where he purchased land and began to build a new life for himself and his family. That's a little bit about the cultural setting, and, and it kind of sets up for what we are about to do. The story of Jacob covers many years and takes him through the region of southern Canaan, beginning with Shechem, okay, uh, <clears throat> Bethel, Bethlehem, Genesis, Hebron, uh, Beersheba, and eventually leading into Egypt, okay. The lesson concludes with Jacob's blessing each of his sons and grandsons bestowing upon them the blessing of Abraham and Isaac, okay? Some of the uh, prominent characters in this lesson, and we'll talk about them. We've talked already a little bit about Jacob, Judah, and then the daughter-in-law, which is Tamar, okay? Uh, a little bit about the uh, introduction. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, our, you know, as, as, in the past, you know, two or three years, we've had this huge, uh, you guys know it, our pandemic, okay? And uh, this 
pandemic has brought to light the horrors of widespread family dysfunction in America and around the world. Uh, this pandemic has really destroyed a lot of people, a lot of family, uh, a lot of things, but uh, God doesn't make any mistakes. This happened for a reason, okay? Uh, a dysfunctional family is one which there is an absence of genuine love, commitment, and relation, relational harmony mixed up, okay? Often dysfunctional families are characterized by violence, neglect, abuse, poverty, and marital conflict. And we talked a little bit about that the other day. When the leaders of the family, the mom, the dad, the husband, the wife, when they have problems, it trickles down, the trickle down effect, okay? It rolls down hill. And so whatever it hits going down that hill, it's gonna happen. Uh, something bad may happen, uh, uh, something unnatural, uh, but it rolls downhill when it starts from the top, okay? Uh, often dysfunctional families are characterized, we got that, if a marriage exists at all, the problems of family dysfunction and disintegration have been a longstanding reality for many African-American families going back to the period of chattel slavery, okay? Listen to this, a great deal, and, and this brings it out, and it's it's right here. It's telling us it's right here. A great deal of research has been done on the plight of the African American family. We have been analyzed, scrutinized, examined, investigated, dissected, and studied more than any other family group of people in America. I found that very interesting. The African American family has been scrutinized for a long, long, long time, okay? Social scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, family experts, and others have come up with a list of reasons for why the plight of the African-American family is in its current state of disarray, disaffection, and disorder, right? They've come up with these ideas. I would surmise that the problems of African-American families are historically, culturally, economically, socially, and spiritually based. They are more complex than many of us realize and cannot be easily resolved. We have been beaten. We have been scrutinized. We have been <clears throat> taken apart, built up, torn down. Uh, it's all right here. And it, this thing with the African-American family and the dysfunction of our African-American families didn't just start today as we get into the lesson you'll see that jacob's family is dysfunctional okay <clears throat> uh and uh it, it it takes you through uh a few things that they did and the things that are happening uh, quite frankly uh today uh and and it's 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 it wasn't pretty then and it's not pretty now okay in today's lesson we see family dysfunction on full display in the very family that God called to be his chosen people. God called this family, all right? Wasn't perfect, nobody's perfect, but God, but God, okay? Nobody's perfect, okay? We are introduced to the sons and daughter of Jacob and his extended family, his daughter-in-law, Tamar. Jacob's sons were the cause of a great deal of family conflict and dysfunction, okay? Starts from the top, like I said. So the things that they were doing, they saw it and they emanated. Or they, they, they did it. They did it themselves, okay? The sons of Jacob were filled with jealousy, anger, resentment, and hostility, all of which led to a host of grievous sins, a whole lot of grievous sins, yet God's gracious favor 
upon this family ensure that the plan of redemption would be carried through to fulfillment, okay? This family was a promise that God was going to, he was going to bring out the 12 tribes of Israel out of this group, okay? Uh, and as we get through it, that the, the, you know, the sons of the, of the Abraham, his promise to Abraham, God's promise to Abraham, a little, Abraham, a little bit, a bit about this uh, background, biblical background throughout the scriptures, we see where God holds leaders to a higher ethical standard, has to, higher ethical standard. Leaders are required to serve God and the people with sincerity, got to be true to God and God's word, got to be true to it. Leaders have to lead, okay? <clears throat> In this lesson, God's concern for leadership involves the submitted and repentant heart of a leader. Jacob's firstborn son, Reuben, which in your family tree, your firstborn son, quite naturally, once the leader, the dad dies, their firstborn son is the one that takes over and continues on with the family. In this case, this did not happen because Reuben would not repent. He wanted to do all the things that he was doing and he didn't want to repent and he did not. So that privilege did not get to Reuben, okay? Reuben showed no remorse for his sexual misconduct while Judah acknowledged his sin, both in his intentional infidelity and his reluctance to exceed Tamar's legally appropriate demand for a husband, okay? Tamar played the role of a harlot enticing Judah, and you'll see that here in a minute, only for him to discover later that she was his daughter-in-law, okay? She was his daughter-in-law, and as I said, dysfunction, and it's right here uh, in the Bible, okay? It's right here telling us what this situation was. In the final passage uh, from Genesis 49, 10 through 12, we have the final blessing of Jacob, bestowed upon Judah and his brothers. The images of the lion and the scepter and the imagery of domination support not only Judah's preeminence among his brothers, but also his new role in the future uh, David line, line of God's plan of salvation, okay? Uh, Judah's blessing has been traditionally applied to the Messiah by the Jews and to David and Jesus by the church. The one who bears the scepter comes to announce the inbreaking of God's kingdom. The one who bears the scepter. And we know who that person is that bears the scepter. Now, as we get into uh, a little bit, one, one more thing I want to say before we get into the lesson. Uh, <clears throat> our lesson in focus. The story of the patriarchal family's dysfunction. This, this is coming from our, our uh, teacher's manual. Uh, the story of the patriarchal family's dysfunctional behaviors in Genesis fits the plot of current day reality shows and soap operas. A dysfunctional family is one with members who may be divided by emotional disconnection disagreement, deception, or disrespect. If family members are unable to examine and resolve these issues, these characteristics, be, characteristics become generational. They go, they go downhill, all right? They get the little ones, okay? Jacob's children experience parental favoritism, okay? That happens in all families, okay? internal power struggles, okay, internal power, loveless parental relationships, parents have to be on top of things, okay, ineffective communication, selfness, selfishness, and bitterness. It's happening. This is Jacob's family back in the day, but this applies to our families today. Dysfunction, bitterness, okay, Jealousy, hatred, you got that, I want that, okay? I want it. Uh, daddy gave it to me or daddy or mama said I could have that. 
No, it, it, that's, that's, that's what this dysfunction uh, is, is all about, okay? This unfortunate pattern of family chaos and confusion created a series of regrettable, unnecessary stumbling blocks in the pathway to God's plan for them, okay? This is God's plan. This is God's family. This is God's promise, okay? The 12 tribes of Israel came out of this family. Now, as we get into it, uh, I'll be reading, I'll, I'll continue to read here with uh, uh, the King James Version. Our first uh, scripture section comes from uh, Genesis 35, 22b through 26, and this one's entitled The Sons of Jacob, and this is the history of Jacob's sons, and, and uh, let's read it. It reads as follows. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. So obviously Jacob had 12 sons. And it's going to list the, the mothers of each son. Okay, now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, okay, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padaram. These are the sons of Jacob. And as you heard that in this reading, you heard of the mothers, okay? Leah, okay, uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel's handmaid, okay, come on now, that's just function, all right, that's crazy, uh, and, but it's right here, it's unbelievable, but it's right here in the Bible, it's in the word, okay, uh, verses 22b through 26, these verses contain the first listing of the sons of Jacob after he re-entered Canaan. This list lays the foundation of the recognition of the 12 tribes of Israel as the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, okay? God can do whatever God wants to do. He can choose who he wants to choose. The list is not chronological in order by birth. Uh, rather, they are listed according to their mother's name with Leah being first, followed by Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Rachel's maid. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, there are lists of the sons of Israel and their descendants, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Reuben is always listed as Jacob's firstborn, despite his failure and insidious actions. He didn't want to repent, okay? He's his firstborn, but he wanted to keep doing what he wanted to do. What is apparent in the record is that the absence of Dinah. Dinah is Jacob's daughter from the list. There is no reason given why she was omitted, okay? But she was raped and two of her brothers killed because of her being done the way she was, okay? But that's uh, <coughs> uh, another lesson. See Genesis 30, 21, and then 34, 1. The writer noted in verse 26 that these were the sons born to Jacob in Padaram. Benjamin was born in Canaan during the journey from Beth to Bethlehem, okay? Some interpreters believe that the purpose of the text is to highlight the faithfulness of God to his promises to Abraham and Isaac and then to Jacob. Again, the 12 tribes of Israel is coming out of this dysfunctional family, okay? Each of the patriarchs committed acts that we would say disqualify them from receiving the promise of God. We all have done stuff like that 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 uh, would include us in this list to disqualify us from a, a blessing from the Lord. Yet God does not act according to human standards, but chooses His own based upon His pro, uh, prerogatives. He can choose who he wants. He can take the worst man, worst woman, worst whatever, and make them a leader because he is God, okay? 
The list also makes it plain that the promises of God are greater than the sins of men and women. God's promise is better than any way. His grace is sufficient. Jacob's family will be a perfect example of a dysfunctional family. Nothing in Jacob's past or in the lives of his children separated him from the promises of God that included many offspring and much land. Here, there is hope for every family that regardless of our sins, I said it a minute ago, grace and hope are always present and active with God. But God, this is about God and him doing what he wants. But God, okay? But God, he deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Let us continue. Uh, in our second uh, <clears throat> section, Judah's infidelity is revealed. As I said, Judah is the family leader, and as he does, so does his sons. And as I will read this and, and hear Genesis 38, 24 through 26. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. Hmm. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelet and staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she hath been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Shelah, my son, and he again, and he knew her again no more. She was with child. And the person that gave her these items was Jacob. And so, as we get into it a little bit more, or <clears throat> Judah, excuse me, the story of Tamar and Judah resolves around a childless widow named Tamar, who just happened to be the daughter-in-law of Judah, Jacob's fourth son. Judah had three sons. The first two died, one being the husband of Tamar. Judah bethroned Tamar to Shelah, Judah's youngest, and stole survive, and sole surviving son. When it was time for this marriage to take place, Judah failed to follow through, and Tamar took matters into her own hands. The ancient Hebrew custom of Levite marriage sanctioned the marriage of a widow to her deceased husband's brother. Okay, see Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, Ruth uh, 3 and 10 and 13, and see also Luke 20, 27 through 32. Three, Deuteronomy 25 and 26 provide the rationale for this practice. The first son she bears shall carry the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Okay. Verse 24, three months into the amount of time is the amount of time that had elapsed between Judah's sexual uh, liaison with Tamar and the point at which her pregnancy was revealed. Okay. Three months. Okay. We are not told who informed Judah about uh, Tamar's uh, pregnancy, so obviously he didn't know, okay? Uh, he simply received word that Tamar had become pregnant while playing a harlot. So she played uh, the, the role of that, that harlot to get to him, okay? Such news were, uh, would readily be uh, passed along to Judah for she eventually, evidently still had marital obligations to Judah's family. He had not released her to marry another, which later was an option provided in, the, in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. As head of the family, Judah had the right and obligation to see that justice was done, okay? When it was noticeable is that, what is noticeable is that the accuser is never identified. Hmm. 
just the accusation. Judah did not request to see Tamar or interrogate her regarding the ac uh, her accusations of the identity of the purported, uh, purported father. He announced judgment and punishment. So he wants her stoned, okay? He wants her out of there, okay? <clears throat> Bring her forth and let her be burnt. He wanted her burnt, sorry, not stoned, burnt. This was a very severe sentence and given that Hebrew punishment for acts of adultery or illicit sexual acts or stoning, okay? Uh, Deuteronomy 21, 22, 21 through 24, the execution was to take place outside of the camp or the city walls. Execution. So he was going to execute her, okay? Uh, and in verse 25, when Tamar was brought forth, okay, probably to the place of the execution, she still had in her possession the items given to her by Judah that served as a promissory note of payment for the sexual liaison. He gave her some stuff. He promised her some stuff and he gave her these things. And when it came to pass, when it came to fruition, when it came true, when it came forth, okay? Uh, what the items were that were given were uh, a signet, bracelets and a staff and particularly important items for the head of a household. Tamar did not offer a defense for her sentence. She had staked her whole defense on the items in her possession. She knew what was going to happen when she brought forth those items, saying that the father of her child was the very man to whom the items belong. Wow. Judah received the items sent by Tamar. His, his, his confidence was pricked. He did not know. He was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he knew that he was the father of Tamar's unborn child. Judah did not attempt to justify or deny the reality of what had happened. He didn't, he didn't justify, he didn't, he couldn't because she had those items that he gave her when this took place. Okay. He publicly acknowledged that he had failed Tamar by not ensuring that she was properly married to his youngest son. Okay. Shayla, although he may not have been within his rights to continue the relationship with Tamar, Judah had no further sexual contact with her after finding all of that out. Okay. <clears throat> Clearly, it is Judah who failed on several on, on very various fronts. He failed. He failed. Okay. Uh, again, dysfunction. He failed to follow through on the custom of ensuring that his youngest son fulfilled the, Le the Leverite duty to his deceased brother. So she was promised to uh, his son and Judah did not go through on that promise, okay? In the end, God's will and plan were still carried forth. In the end, here we go again, God. But God, in the end, God's will and plan were still carried forth. We have seen, Okay, that the chosen family was fraught with acts of internet of intentional sin, yet God's grace, God's grace, God's grace surpasses even the greatest wickedness that the human heart can devise. There is nothing that God can't and won't do. There is nothing. There is nothing. Uh, we'll continue on uh, in our final. Uh, 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 portion of our lesson, and we'll get through it here shortly. Uh, <clears throat> Jacob's blessing to Judah, Genesis 49, 10 through 12, reads as follows. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foe unto the vine, and his ass coat unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. And as we get through this last part, uh, Genesis 49 ends the patriarchal history as Jacob is gathered uh, in death to his forebearers. The chapter contains the final blessings or testaments of Jacob to his 12 sons. Prior to his death and the pronouncement of blessings upon his son, Jacob blessed 
the sons of Joseph, giving to Joseph a double portion. This blessing of Ephraim and uh, Manasseh meant that Reuben would not occupy the place of primacy in the family, despite his being the firstborn son. And the reason, again, as we said, that he did not get that uh, is because he would not repent. He would not repent. And, and so with him not repenting, he couldn't take over the family, okay? In verse 10, Jacob announced that Judah will replace Reuben as the leader of the family. Reuben had defiled the bed of his father Okay, because he, uh, when he had sexual intercourse with Bilbah, Jacob's concubine. So again, dysfunction. He was mad at his son because he had sex with his concubine. Okay, so he couldn't get it. He wasn't going to get it. Simeon and Levi had acted out of rage and anger and killed innocent people. Okay, in one sense, Jacob did not pass along to his three sons the blessings received from Abraham and Isaac. The scepter denotes a symbol of authority or leadership, usually a staff or a rod, okay? Uh, David was not the first king. It was Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, who was the first king of Israel. The words, not a lawgiver from between his feet, are a further expansion of the announcement regarding a ruler from Judah. Shiloh was a place in Israel located a few miles northeast of Jerusalem, okay? Here in this verse, the context suggests that it refers to a person because the word Shiloh can mean peace or one who brings peace. One who brings peace, peace. Jesus, he brings peace. He brings love, okay? The early Christians saw uh, in the words of a prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. That prophecy was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. He was the Messiah, okay? He was the one that was going to get the scepter. He was the scepter. Uh, in our final couple of verses, uh, these verses are filled with a figurative language that describes a time of great prosperity uh, that would come to the sons of Israel. Some interpreters have seen these in these verses the images of Jesus washing his clothes in the blood spilled on Calvary. However, the context does not lend itself to the interpretation. It's better understood as a period of great prosperity that would result from the rule of Judean kings. Such prosperity developed during the reigns of David and Solomon, okay? Uh, and, uh, and these final verses also have, we have yet another example of God's gracious favor being shown to the chosen people. God chose this group. God chose this family. And this was a dysfunctional family that did everything under the sun. But God chose this family through his promise through Abraham and Isaac. Okay, God continues to raise up a new generation of leaders for his people, just as Judah's name provoked praise to God. So the name of Jesus Christ provokes our praise and adoration today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God bless him. God bless his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, as we end up uh, a little, a couple things on our concluding uh, reflection. Listen, nobody's perfect. Our families are far from perfect, okay? Uh, but as you continue to get in the word, and as you continue to, to learn of God and to learn of all the things that he's done, uh, stay in the word, stay on your knees. We're not perfect. Uh, all of our families are, are uh, some are good, some are bad, okay? Uh, but God, but God, God's grace is sufficient. And this is all about God and all about him doing what he wants to do and all about him blessing who he wants to bless. You don't have to be perfect. We're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but one, only one perfect being, Okay. Uh, and uh, throughout the history of Israel, there was an expectation that God would one day bring to pass a glorious future for his people. Even today, men and women continue to look for that time when the kingdom of God will be realized on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, as, and, and as we talked about the last couple of years uh, and how things have, have gone awry because of this pandemic. 
Okay, the past two years have been a time of widespread despair, discouragement, and dismay throughout America and around the world. And it's because of this global pandemic, okay? Uh, life has become fragile and tenuous, okay? And then at, at, at Jacob looked forward to the time when the Lord would rise, would raise a new leader from among the sons of Israel. He did not know what and who this unknown ruler would be, yet he saw coming out of the loins of Judah. In the fulfillment of time, God set forth his beloved son, Jesus Christ. In him, God has come near and bought the abundant life to all who believe. Jacob's pronouncement to Judah reminds us that God's future, although distant and afar off, will be a time of great rejoicing. But God, God can do all. He can do everything but fail, okay? God is God. God deserves all the blessings, all the love, all the honor, all the glory uh, that he gets. He deserves it all. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. And we thank God for being God all by himself. Yes, we have dysfunction. Yes, we have all those problems. Yes. Some things we can do, some things we can't. Yes, but God, but God, and we thank God for being God and being God all by himself. Thank you uh, for this morning. Thank you for allowing me to come into your home this morning and say a word or two. Get into this lesson, read it, and uh, uh, you'll understand a few things about how God's grace is sufficient. Again, we are located here, 2624 East 25th Street, where the Honorable Reverend Vichy Lee Lines Jr. is our pastor. Uh, we're going to make way for our message this morning. Uh, <clears throat> and there will be a message from on high. We just thank God uh, for this day and uh, in his blessings. Uh, I'll say a short prayer. I like the prayer that is in our in our in our book. Let's let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, may we always look for the day when the Lion of Judah will reign in your kingdom forever. Grant that we may live in a way that will honor you through our words and deeds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you once again for allowing me to come in to your homes. God bless you. And we will make way for our, our message for this morning. God bless.